Well, look, good afternoon, everyone, um, or good morning, depending on which part from around the world you're um, you're joining us uh, from. Um, my name's Jake Phillips. I'm the Extension Manager at Angus Australia, and it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome you all along to this uh, Angus Connect event. Um, so thanks for your uh, thanks for your attendance and interest in what we're doing at Angus Australia and. Um, uh, today, we're certainly going to be um, taking a bit of a dive into some of the upcoming taste enhancements um, that are happening with our genetic evaluation for the uh, December analysis. Um, just a little bit of um, housekeeping. Um, we are recording this um, event today, which will be available um, at a later stage uh, in the near future for uh, further reference. Um, if you do have um, questions, um, if we could just put them in the chat and we will be monitoring that. Um, throughout today, we will have the opportunity to um, to ask questions um, and hopefully provide all of that information that um, that you've joined us here today uh, to listen to. Um, we are also going to be joined, and I'll introduce some team members um, in just a few moments uh, by some uh, external presenters that have uh, helped us with this collaboration um, and the research to be able to develop um, and deliver um, these products uh, as part of our evaluation. Um, so we'll welcome those people. Um, we will hopefully be wrapped up within the hour to not uh, take too much time of people's um, uh, day. And uh, we will also cover a little bit about the um, the World Angus evaluation. So I suppose um, today's agenda, um, effectively the, the front uh, part of this uh, presentation um, and the, the various content that we've got for, um, for you um, is sort of broken into three main categories. Um, and the taste enhancements this year, which um, you'll hear from our presenters, um, effectively will um, cover three main areas, including the optimal use of genomics, and we're going to hear a little bit more um, about some of the research that's been done through through AGBU and um, partnerships with ABRI and um, and also with Angus Australia about increasing the weighting applied to genomics um, relationship. And we're also going to be talking about um, and hearing some content in regards to um, docility transitioning to a single step model. Um, we also have some enhancements around that genetic evaluation, efficiency and maintenance. Um, and so we've got some updates on, on those enhancements, um, as well as some of the, um, the research breeding values, which, um, which we'll um, dive into um, at, towards the end of the, um, uh, the enhancement presentation. But um, some really notable achievements um, there, not only for the Angus breed, but certainly for the beef industry more broadly. Um, and we will um, certainly acknowledge the, uh, the con contributions from various staff and, um, and researchers along the way. Uh, at the end, we will have a, a Q and A session. We are um, going to be joined live by a number of the um, presenters today, so that would be a good chance to uh, to ask those questions that you may have um, throughout today's content. Um, and certainly encourage you to put those into the chat, and um, I'll do my best to uh, to go through those uh, as we get towards the end of the um, the presentation. I think before we start, though, um, to dive into some of the more technical content. Um, one of the questions that uh, is often asked um, from industry, from our members and um, including us internally is, uh, why do we actually even um, consider or, or bother doing enhancements to our genetic evaluation? Um, we've had a, um, a very substantial evaluation that's had a lot of work over time. Um, we provide um, decent information to breeders to make selection decisions on and, and to benchmark cattle. So why would we continue to go back and reevaluate the science and reevaluate um, some of the, um, how the, I suppose, the inner mechanism of how the ge uh, genetic evaluation works. And I think it comes back, in my mind at least, and, and perhaps in many others too, um, I suppose our role of, as breeders, um, as a breed society, and indeed the industry and, and researchers more broadly, but today's information is really going to be talking about uh, how can we provide increased selection accuracy um, or better information, I suppose, on on animals so cattle breeders can make better breeding decisions. And it's about taking uh, less risk. Um, unfortunately, we can't ensure against making bad decisions, um, but if we know more information and that information is more accurate on individuals, then perhaps we can stand a, uh, a better chance to, uh, to increase our selection accuracy. Um, so that will be a, a, a theme for today's um, presentation. And you'll hear from our presenters that um, there certainly is a, um, a united and, and pretty consistent message there about increasing the selection accuracy, which of course then so supports um, an increase in selection intensity about choosing the best animals more often. Um, and perhaps depending on your production situation, um, being able to utilize those animals um, earlier in their life because we have that information available. So 
I just did want to put that um, right out in front that today is about providing um, accurate tools um, for people to make better breeding decisions. And of course, the first breeding decision uh, many of our breeders uh, would be considering is who, um, in terms of mating candidates and um, thinking about sire selection or female retention and um, that's an evolving and, and um, an ongoing process that happens um, throughout the year. And so if we can provide that information on those individuals to make a, um, an informed breeding decision um, with more information and perhaps, um, perhaps more accuracy than what we've had previously, then that really is our commitment to enhancing the taste evaluation um, and bringing in new traits that have got higher accuracy uh, when we can. So I suppose um, we also have a history um, as Angus Australia to, um, to provide the most up-to-date and, and most relevant um, tools to increase in that precision uh, for maximising the, the potential genetic gain for Angus breeding programs. Um, and of course, over the, um, over the duration of the taste evaluation, we do have a history of routinely doing this every December um, and some December analysis um, attract a more comprehensive um, enhancement or, or range of enhancements and some are more streamlined. So um, the other point that we would raise is some of the enhancements too, you may not see as cattle breeders um, or as members, but they're certainly for our operational and, and evaluation of efficiencies as well as we get more phenotypes, more genotypes and more usage of the data. There is some um, some ongoing maintenance that, uh, that we need to do to be able to keep delivering those tools um, longer term. The Angus Australia Board, um, as well as the, the staff at Angus Australia, certainly appreciate um, how important and it, it uh, of course is a, a pretty core value and it's a critical objective um, for us to deliver these genetic improvement tools. Um, and you can see this snapshot from um, the recent uh, strategic plan that we're in year one of, um, the new five-year strategic plan that genetic improvement is a really core pillar uh, that we see as an organisation for our members to uh, have ongoing success. Um, and hopefully that leads to the uh, the uh, the profitability and 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 increased productivity of our members uh, through having those tools available. So that's um that's just a bit of a background just sets the scene. Um, we will now move into um, our our enhancements and some of this material is um, pre-recorded, but we are lucky to have uh, a representative of um, the organisations um, that have worked towards these um, enhancements today. Um, and so after each of the um, the, the pre-recorded videos, which will of course be available later on as well, um, I will just pause for, for just a moment to, um, to ask if that presenter would like to add anything um, and um, a good opportunity to um, good opportunity to um, uh, ask any questions. And of course, we will have that Q and A session um, uh, a little later. Okay. Um, so. Just to acknowledge um, uh, some of the enhancements to start with um, is that um, through AGBU, the Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit, um, and we're lucky to be joined by um, Dr. Andrew Swan today, who's a chief scientist and um, is certainly well regarded within the Australian industry and, and across the world um, for a lot of the work that's been done in both um, sheep and cattle um, breeds for, for genomics and genetic evaluation. But um, the team at AGBU um, and including Steve Miller, uh, Philip German and, and Natalie Connors. Um, we do appreciate the, the contributions um, to these first couple of enhancements, certainly, and their ongoing support, as well as Brad Crook um, at Breed Plan through ABRI, um, as well as the ongoing support uh, financially and, and in kind of, um, of all those businesses, but um, including Meat and Livestock Australia as well. Angus Australia has observed exponential growth in the number of genotypes submitted for genetic evaluation purposes in recent years, as this graphic shows. With over 300,000 genomic profiles now available, it is important to continually review how to optimally utilise the genomic information within the evaluation with the aim to providing the highest accuracy estimated breeding values. The following two enhancements, as presented by Dr Andrew Swan from the Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit, focuses on the genomics area, specifically an increase in genomic relationship weighting and incorporation of genomics in docility. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Swan, one of the team behind the development of breed plant systems used in the Trans-Tasman Angus cattle evaluation. In this video, we'll be looking at an enhancement to the evaluation to make better use of genomic information. 
Genomics has revolutionised genetic evaluation systems over the past decade, with Angus Australia being a leader in adopting single-step analysis procedures, combining phenotypic data with pedigree and genotypes. With large reference populations for a number of key traits and around 300,000 animals currently genotyped, the TASTE system has become a very powerful single-step analysis. One of the key features of single-step is that it can more accurately track shared DNA through genomic relationships between animals. In the pre-genomics era, relationships between animals were tracked through the pedigree, and all animals of a certain relationship type were assumed to share the same proportion of DNA. In the example shown here, all of these progeny have an assumed relationship of 0.25 with their grandsire through the pedigree, or 25% shared DNA. With the benefit of genomic information, however, we can get a much more accurate picture, and in this stylized example, the genomic relationships vary from 0.23 to 0.27. The single step method allows us to balance pedigree and genomic relationships according to how confident we are in their relative accuracy. When single step was first introduced, there was a degree of uncertainty about genomic testing, and an equal weighting of 50% was deemed appropriate. But as genotyping platforms have developed to high standards, it has become apparent that the genomic weighting can be increased. One reason this makes sense is that pedigree is often verified through genomic testing, meaning there is a high level of consistency between the two sources. So recent testing conducted by our team at AGBU has shown that the weighting can now be increased to 95%. This testing involves a validation procedure where we first run the full taste analysis to generate full EBVs. We then do a second analysis where we remove the phenotype records from recently born animals, and by retaining their pedigrees and genotypes, we can get a part EBV for recent animals, which we can then compare to their full EBVs. The question then is how well do EBVs from the part analysis predict EBVs from the full analysis? And the answer is very well indeed, as we can see in this figure, which shows the range in validation accuracies across traits for the pre-genomic era pedigree model and single-step models with weightings of 50 and 95%. As you can see, there is substantial improvement in validation accuracy in moving from pedigree to single-step and further gains by moving the emphasis on genomic information to 95%. Breeders will see some changes in EBVs with the update, particularly for genotyped animals who are not recorded for a specific trait. And as this figure shows, there will be increases in published EBV accuracies for genotyped animals, shown in green in this figure, compared to current accuracies shown in orange. So the key points to remember are that from December 2023, the weighting on genomic information will increase in the main taste analysis from 50 to 95%. There will be some changes in EBVs, but our validations show that the result is the increased accuracy of EBVs, with the bottom line being that increased accuracy creates the potential for increased genetic gain. In this video, we'll be looking at how our team at AGBU has worked with Angus Australia to develop a new genomic evaluation for docility. Docility is a key trait for Angus breeders, with increasing numbers of animals recorded over the last decade, and as you can see in this figure, most of the animals recently recorded have also been genotyped. But up until now, EBVs for docility have not incorporated genomic information, and in fact, this is the last remaining analysis within TASTE not to do so. So the main motivation for the new development has been the inclusion of genomic information in a full single-step analysis. But in addition, a key feature is that we have switched from a categorical to a continuous trait model. This greatly simplifies the analysis and allows us to use the full range of scores, including half scores. During the R&D phase, we found that heritabilities were similar under either model, both slightly under 20%. And importantly, EBVs will still be presented in the same way with higher docility EBVs indicating that an animal is expected to produce a higher percentage of progeny with acceptable temperament. However, breeders will see changes in EBVs, but these are mostly due to the addition of genomics rather than the switch to the continuous trait model. Validation analyses also carried out during the R&D phase 
showed that the new genomic EBVs are better predictors of future performance. This plot shows the degree of change in EBVs for high accuracy size, with a correlation between EBVs from old and new models at 0.87. So sires with good temperament are identified in both. Other groups of animals can show greater changes, with the correlation for 2021 drop bulls at 0.67, for example. So while there will be changes in EBVs, our validations show that these changes will result in greater selection accuracy, which will also be reflected in higher EBV accuracies for genotyped animals, as you can see in this figure. In terms of benefits of the new analysis, we will see increased accuracy from the inclusion of genomics, while behind the scenes there will be improved computational performance and better use of information which will pave the way for a simpler integration with other traits in future. For example, we can consider analysing docility with flight time data, or even as a trait in the main taste evaluation. Uh, thanks everyone. Um, I might just ask if, um, if Andrew Swan is there or, or Christian Duff, um, is there anything that you'd like to add to those first couple of points that we've heard about this afternoon? I know that um, I've got one or two questions that have come to my mind, but is there any um, further points you'd like to add there to uh, to either of you, I suppose. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jake. Um, yeah, I just want to want to probably acknowledge, like you've done at the start, just the uh, great work done by Agbu and, and the team through Breed Plan and supported by MLA, obviously, to to get to this point. Um, the genomic weighting is definitely a significant enhancement, um, and getting that change based on where we currently sit with genomics and the amount of records coming. We probably should also pay acknowledgement to our members who. You know, I've done the heavy lifting with uh, getting genotyping done and paying for that and a lot of the phenotypes attached, coupled with our reference population program. So um, that's important to, to acknowledge as well, Jake. Brilliant. Um, Andrew, have you um, been able to join us there? I see you're, uh, you're logged in. Can you hear us, Andrew? Yep, I can. Thanks, Jake, and thanks, Christian. Um, yeah, I probably just add that, um, you know, on the first development, increasing the genomic weighting, um, you know, it's it's something that um, is perhaps a little bit overdue, um, but what you're getting out of it is a big lift in, in uh, inaccuracy across a number of traits. And with the, um, the size of your reference populations, you're in a pretty impressive um, um, position in terms of, the accuracy of your evaluation. So, so that's that one. Um, on the docility side, also, um, you know, you saw the the number of of um, the growth in in phenotyping in docility and and the number of animals that are genotyped with phenotype. So, that's also a very timely um, you know enhancement that. Uh, that was well worth making and we're, we're really pleased to be able to do that. Brilliant. So just um, just got one question uh, for either of you, I suppose. Um, if you, uh, Christian, you mentioned about the reference populations, do you think that particularly that first enhancement um, with the genomics weighting, is that going to help us leverage some of the things we've been doing in the ASVP or you know, in, in other herds that we would consider a strong contributor to the reference as well? Does that, does that, help us with that oh absolutely jake so so uh, andrew gave a, a nice demonstration of um understanding shared dna with with animals even from from like pedigree i guess you would say with a common common grandsire but where it's really exciting is where we can now link animals on common dna or shared dna where we don't really have that relationship through pedigree so a good way to think about that is in the asbp um, which has been running for 14 years now uh, we have we have pedigree on the sire side in those progeny, but we don't have really. Uh, most animals don't have pedigree on the dam side, so so we we know the contribution from a pedigree basis on the sire side, but we, on the dam side we don't really have any understanding. But using genomics and using a 0.95 to lambda, we can get much more more leverage out of those uh, reference populations for those hard to measure traits like carcass and fertility and feed intake and methane going forward things. So yeah, it's pretty pretty exciting. So I think. Um, you know, it's definitely the the right time to to get more value out of uh, our reference as well because they they're things that we all contribute to and they and they they do cost as well. Yeah. Brilliant. And probably just one more question there, unless um, Andrew's got something to add. But while while we've got you, um, Christian, and this might be more more of a question for you anyway. But 
Um, it's interesting to hear the the transition of docility single step. Obviously, there's been a bit of work on the docility trait in EBV in recent years. Some of our members might remember that um, um, we're able to do some enhancements last year where, you know, just about all the animals or approximately 90% of animals um, came in to then receive an, a docility EBV. There's been some base adjustments. So in terms of a single trait, there's been a bit of action around the docility EBV of late. Um, do you think we can expect that to continue or is this pretty much going to bring it in line with other traits or what's your thoughts on that? Oh, look, I do, I do acknowledge, you know, we made made, made probably two years of, of reasonable enhancements to docility, um, both warranted. Um, in, in a perfect world, we probably would have aligned it and done any one enhancement in one year, but um, that, that wasn't the case. Um, but I think where we're sitting now with docility, um, you know, I, I can't see us uh, making any major changes to that model in the in the short to medium term. Andrew might might say otherwise, I'm interested in his thoughts on it, but I think where we'll sit with a single step docility um I think that's um, yeah, we, we will land for a while and obviously um, um, let that settle with the with the breeding bees as such. Yep. Yeah, I think I think um, just following on from what Christian said, I th I think you're at a point now where um, you you can you can let it sit there for a while um, as it is at the moment that docility analysis and um, just see you know maybe it's a further research in the in the future that that uh, you could think about but just relationships with other traits I suppose would be interesting at some stage but but I think that you know you've got a pretty good evaluation in this single trait model at the moment brilliant okay well thanks guys and um look we might hear from you a little bit later on and we'll we'll try our best to get your video working there Swanee too but um we'll keep punching because I'm aware of everyone's time and we'll sort of move into those um, those next couple of um, um, enhancements around that uh, evaluation efficiency and, and um, a couple of the traits that are particularly involved um, there, if we like. But thanks, uh, Andrew, and, and thanks, Christian. No problem. Several other enhancements of note will be implemented in the December 2023 TACE enhancements. These are less significant, but form an important part of the ongoing maintenance and efficiency gains to the Trans-Tasman Angus cattle evaluation. The first of these being an updated to software to improve the efficiency of the single step calving ease evaluation. Testing has shown that this enhancement will reduce the time taken to run the full single step calving ease evaluation from 2.8 days to 1.3 days. Uh, this software enhancement will have no noticeable impact on the calving ease EBVs However, in the overall enhancements, changes may be observed due to the updates of the genomic relationship weighting, as mentioned in previous material on these enhancements. Another enhancement is software modifications to better handle days to calving data. This particularly focuses on females that have been transferred or changed ownership and with mating records in more than one herd. Importantly, this enhancement will ensure that the days to calving EBV more accurately reflects records over the lifetime of a female. This may lead to some EBV changes on individual animals, though it is a more accurate representation of the data. The last enhancement in this section is the usual maintenance to the genomics pipeline. This covers re-estimation of the reference haplotype library, incorporation of additional SNPs, and re-estimation of the allele frequencies. For more detail on these, please refer to the 2023 TACE enhancement resources or previous material, including that from the 2022 TACE enhancements. The genomic pipeline enhancements will result in only minor changes in EBVs and EBV accuracies. Just some more acknowledgements um, as we move into um, some of our enhancements to do with the, the research breeding values um, and, and certainly the continued support from um, the people that we acknowledged um, straight up. But uh, there's certainly been some more um, pivotal assistance um, in the research breeding value enhancements that we'll be showing you today. Um, some of our external assistance that we've had is um, certainly the help from Professor um, Sam Clark at the University of New England and Dr. Hassan Alilu um, as well. And, and their contributions have been significant, um, particularly with the assistance of um, Malshani Samawira, um, our geneticist at, um, at Angus Australia. And, and um, a lot of the work that we're about to showcase uh, wouldn't have been possible without those people. Um, and even though he didn't want the acknowledgement, um, certainly there's been a 
um, a fair bit of assistance and um, and um, supervision, but really the driving force behind a lot of these things um, for some time has been our own Christian Duff, um, the general manager of genetic improvement. I um, also just wanted to contribute the, uh, or sorry, acknowledge the um, the contribution from um, GHPC Consulting as well as part of that process. And this is really um, the the proud thing about some of these enhancements is we've been able to do them um, internally. So. Um, yeah, very much a, a great milestone for Angus Australia and I uh, look forward to um, hearing about these enhancements to the research breeding values. The Trans-Tasman Angus cattle evaluation currently includes six RBVs, including mature body condition, mature cow height, coat type, immune index, MSA marbling and shear force. As part of the 2023 TACE enhancements, substantial changes will be made to three of the RBVs, including mature body condition, mature cow height and coat type. These have been possible through the significant increase in associated phenotypes that have been recorded and submitted for genetic evaluation in recent years, as shown by this graphic. This particularly shows the increase in the recording of mature cow body composition traits in recent years, off the back of the Breeding Better Breeders initiative and publishing the associated research breeding values. Dr. Malshani Samawira, Angus Australia's geneticist, will now take you through the specific RBV enhancements. There will be significant enhancement to the calculation of mature body condition, mature cow height, and coat type research breeding values, or RBVs, in 2023 days enhancements. Three key updates have been incorporated into the research breeding values. There will be more animals with published research breeding values. The variance components, including the heritabilities, have been re-estimated and will be incorporated into the December evaluations. Genomics is now incorporated through a single step model to cow body composition traits. Now let's take a closer look at each of these enhancements. The first enhancement involves transitioning to a new software to calculating RBVs. This software enables the incorporation of pedigree, phenotypes, and especially the increasing number of genotypes in the evaluation. As a result, more animals will be included in the evaluation, and a greater number of them will display research breeding values for cow body composition and coat type traits. The following table displays the number of animals with research breeding values published pre and post enhancement as you can see, a significantly larger number of animals will have research breeding values published post-enhancement. The second enhancement involves the updating of variance components, including heritabilities. These genetic parameters form the foundation for calculating research breeding values. Therefore, periodic updates are necessary to ensure they match the contemporary data and animals available for breeding. This table shows the available data and heritability estimates for each trait during the initial and new parameter estimation. A greater number of records are available for all three traits for current evaluation, and there has been a significant improvement in heritability for mature body condition. This process is similar to the variance component re-estimates applied to the TES EBVs in December 2022 annual enhancements. The third enhancement involves transitioning from a pedigree-based evaluation to a single-step evaluation model for cow body composition traits. This enhancement is possible through the increase in genomic testing and phenotyping resulting in large number of animals qualifying for the reference population. Will there be RBV re-ranking as a result of these enhancements? These figures illustrate the alignment of all RBVs with the new RBVs for mature body condition, mature cow height, and coat type for sires with accuracies exceeding 75%. Each dot represents the research breeding value of an individual animal. Most of the animals are scattered around the regression line, indicating strong and positive correlations approaching one. However, a few individual animals will experience RBV re-ranking. 
The primary driver for RBB re-ranking in cow body compression traits has been the transition to single step evaluation rather than the use of new heritability estimates. The integration of genotypes into the evaluation is crucial because genotypes provide the direct genetic information about an animal and adding more information means increasing the accuracy of research breeding values. In summary, there are three main enhancements to the research breeding values. There will be more animals with published eBabies. The variance components have been re-estimated and will be incorporated into the December evaluation. Genomics is now incorporated through a single-step evaluation model to cow body compression traits. As a result of these significant enhancements, some individual animals will show RBV re-ranking. However, the RBV correlations are strong and positive. Thanks, um, thanks Balshani. And, um... Dr. Samara Weir, uh, I think, joins us today. Um, are you there, Malshani? Would you like to add anything to the work that you've been doing or um, to that presentation? Um, I know certainly one of the questions that I've got in my mind that um, you may answer or, or possibly Christian, but um, firstly, fantastic to see a number of those traits go in a single step and that more, I think one of the take homes for me, one of the uh, most important parts is that more animals will actually have these EBVs um, displayed on them, so enables people to use them in selection. Um, but also keen to hear Malshani or, or Christian too um, around, will that actually help any of these RBVs become EBVs in time, or how do you see that? Uh, I'll have a first attempt at that, Malshani, and you can you can come in then. Um, yeah, so essentially. Um, you know, obviously, the, the first place you like to start with a new breeding value is to put it out as an RBV um, until you have more understanding of the trait, no genetic correlations with other traits. Um, we have enough data and we're confident in the variance components that, that are sort of underpin it and the models we're using. Um, we're very close in that case in relation to those body composition traits, uh, particularly body condition score and, um, and cow height. So I suspect we'll review that over the next 12 months to see um, whether we do switch that into a published EBV um, uh, for our members to utilise, um, not, not, not published as an RBV. We also have to acknowledge there's other research happening in this space. And I know through AGVU um, and part of the team there, they're also looking at some, some cow body composition work as well. So we also have to align it with what's happening in other areas as well. So that's sort of something over the next 12 months. Um, but I probably should should also say, Jake, none of this would be possible without our members sort of um, taking on board the call and through the Breeding Better Breeders program to collect more phenotypes. Um, you know, we've always get feedback um, about the importance of these these maternal type traits. Um, where Angus is a maternal breed. Um, cows are important, very important. So um, without the data and without the data recording coming in, we couldn't get to this point. So it's a, it's a great achievement in that, that aspect, uh, driven by our members um, collecting the appropriate data um, and also the pedigree and phenotypes and genotypes attached to that. Um, so that's uh, my type two bobs worth there. Mal have you got anything else to add? Um, not specifically. I agree with you, Christian. So cow body among the three research really values that we're going to do with the enhancements. Um, the natural birth condition and cow height having more data coming in compared to both types. So certainly this uh, a trade, and of course it's also an important trade, um, which we can move forward uh, with that as a um, EB education. Brilliant. Well, thanks for your work on that, um, Malshani, and um, yeah, pretty exciting for some of our members that have pretty pretty closely been following some of those RBVs for, for a period of time and um, certainly, certainly think that we'll throw a couple of those um, into the spotlight now as um, we can move forward with single steps. So um, that's fantastic. Um, so I suppose in summary, um, and look, I'm not sure if you, you can see me, I can certainly see myself and Christian, but um, in summary, the, the taste enhancements that we've, we've learned about so far, um, and look, we still do have um, the Q&A session and I know there's a couple of questions in the in the chat um, and also a bit of information on the World Angus evaluation to finish off. But um, I think important to summarise sort of what we've learned about so far this afternoon and um, really the enhancements are, I suppose, covered in three main um, categories, which is around that optimal use of genomics, which we heard 
um, a presentation uh, from Dr. Andrew Swan um, around those um, enhancements, including the, um, the increase in the weighting to the genomics relationship, um, and also through the, uh, the transition of the docility UVV to single step, which um, certainly will be, um, I, I think will be well accepted by members in, in terms of having that um, increased selection accuracy um, that comes with those couple of enhancements. Um, we also um, heard briefly, and they are um, a little bit more operational efficiency type enhancements, but um, a, a, a more efficient um, carving ease EBV analysis, um, which will cut down the time that it takes um, our genetic evaluation to, to run in, in that, um, for those traits, um, as well as the, um, the update to the days to carving uh, traits as well. And um, then we just heard the, the great presentation from, um, from Christian and Malshani um, around those enhanced um, uh, research breeding values um, and a number of those transitioning to, uh, to single step as well as the updated variance components um, as well, which we've of course done, of course done for our uh, multi-trait uh, in 2022. Um, so with that, um, I will just want to the chat. I don't think we've got the capability for everyone to show their uh, beautiful faces um, uh, today. So we will just um, move into um, the QA. I know there was a couple of questions there, which I'll, uh, I'll just facilitate if you like. Um, there was one question that was answered, um, uh, which um, just so everyone's aware, and I might just call on um, Andrew Swan again, but there was a question from, um, no, from Sarah, just in regards to um, that uh, weighting going to 0.95 and uh, what impact that has on phenot uh, phenotype data. And um, you did provide that response to Sarah, but maybe you might just um, talk to that for a, a minute or so, Andrew, about um, how that um, plays out. Yeah, hopefully that was okay, um, Jake, yeah. to answer that. But um, yeah, so it it doesn't, you know, single step combines all the sources of of uh, information in the right way according to the settings that you put it put um, you put into the model. So so what we are doing here is just for um, animals that are genotyped, we are using the full information effectively on their genomic relationships. And then what single step also does is for their relatives who are not genotype, it it propagates that information back through the pedigree. So it's 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 really making the best use of the information. So um I mean hopefully that that answers the question. Um it's the 95% is is um interesting too, I suppose. You might ask, why is that not just a hundred percent? Well, that's it's really effectively a hundred percent. It's just makes it makes the computation of the EBVs a little bit more straightforward and 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 robust. So, but it's having it ninety five percent is is effectively full weighting of of the genomic relationships. Thanks, Andrew. And and um, just before I throw to you, Christian, you may want to add to this, but um, is this really Angus Australia? Um, breaking ground is this the first time this weighting's been used in evaluations or have we seen this before or where does that kind of sit I suppose Andrew or Christian doesn't bother me I, I could I could um, tell you um, we've we've had that we've been doing single steps since 2017 across um, a number of breed plan breeds and also within the sheep genetics evaluation. So I, I'm, um, I work in, in both sheep and beef evaluations in this regard. And in the early days, we set all of those to 0.5. Um, Angus is, we, we've just moved Merinos uh, in the sheep world up a bit. And Angus is the first, one of the first brief breeds to, to move to, to 0.95 in breed plan. Just to um, just add that from a global perspective, um, uh, some of our EBVs we publish through Taste come through AGI, and their their genomic relationship weighting is set at 0.9, so um, traditionally on that higher end. Um, if you look at our research breeding bees done internally that Malshani just explained, uh, the, the genomic relationship weighting is set at 0.95 as well. So I think you'll find um, you know the current genotyping and, and groups that have got reasonable reference populations like Angus, obviously, then then it's quite common to lean towards the higher the higher weighting for the genomic relationship weightings because essentially you get us 
um, more pre precise relationships between animals and better breeding values. So that's really the driver here. That's great. There's a, just another question here, sort of along those lines, but um, uh, I'll take it as moving to single steps. Are, are there other traits that we're currently looking at or doing research on that could transition to single step in future enhancements? Uh, I think we're now, as it sits now, we've actually got all of our, um, and once these taste enhancements have applied, all of our taste EBVs through the breed plan pipeline are single step. And all of our RBVs are also single step, apart from immune index, which is just straight genomics um, SNP effects approach. So um, slight difference there, but essentially genomics. So um, I suspect with any new traits we develop, um, I suspect they'll be under the genomics portfolio um, in in the in the model. Um, I think that's the way we would proceed, unless of course we just had pedigree available, and that's still okay too. It still gives us quite good breeding values, like we've had for many years. So. Um, I think that's the consideration there, Jake. Excellent. Thanks. Um, thanks, Christian. Um, just changing tack a little bit to um, docility now. Um, obviously, one of our more um, observant uh, attendees today. But um, uh, the question is, if the docility regression coefficient is um, to 0.7 or thereabouts, they think, um, effectively, the question is, um, are we going to expect to see slightly less range in EBVs or um, how will that play out? Yeah, I was just typing an answer to that, but stopped when we opened the, the yeah. microphones, Jake. So, yeah, that's right. Um, 0.76, in fact, it, it actually was for that um, set of animals. But um, so that indeed does mean that the new breeding values, you, there'll be slightly less spread. Um, but by and large, you'll be, You'll be looking at similar numbers. Um, you know, they're expressed on the same scale. Um, the correlations that we were we saw in in that plot was actually 0.87. So there will be a bit of a change in in re-ranking for or a change in breeding values for some animals. Um, but as I said during the presentation, that is is by and large because we're moving from a pedigree model to a genomic model that's the biggest impact rather than you know the way we express the trait as a continuous or a or a categorical trait the biggest impact is definitely genomics and part of that bigger change that to what you've seen maybe in some instances before is because rather than going from pedigree to a, a genomic weighting of 50 percent we're going straight to 95 percent so um, it's it does involve a bigger change Thanks, Andrew. Um, just a reminder for everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, please put it in the in the chat. Um, we do have time and, and happy to do that. Um, while people are just considering that, um, probably just one question mainly for Christian. Um, do you think any of the enhancements that we have um, we've heard about today, those three main categories, does that change how people should use the information in selection at all? Uh, not at all. Actually, uh, you just use the UVs like you always have. Um, uh, so I don't think it. I don't think it changes. It changes how you use, utilize EBVs at all. Just to be aware that um, you know there will be some slight re-ranking in animals, um, as we've talked about, depending on the enhancement. Um, but essentially, the EBVs are still the EBVs. Um, you will see higher accuracy generally across the board too on individual EBVs. So that's something to consider. But um, you still select with them like you always have. So that doesn't change any of the the, the process there in using EBVs in selection. Um, Jake, that's for sure. Um, one point I just wanted to probably loop back on is, is that question on um, genomic relationship weighting versus phenotypes. And this is something that's come up quite regularly with the groups we've been talking to so far. Um, just to make very clear, it doesn't, changing the genomic relationship weighting to 0.95 doesn't take away the importance of phenotypes. Without phenotypes, none of this will work. So, you know, if everyone stops today and we don't have any phenotypes in the future, then our EBVs aren't going to be have any accuracy because we need phenotypes going forward and that'll erode over time if we don't. It. The good thing about uh, what's happening in Angus is we're seeing lots of phenotypes come in um, and we have to make sure that's still the message. When we talk about this, this 0.95 weighting, it's really looking at the weighting in, on a relationship basis compared to pedigree relationships, I guess you would say. So that's a simplistic way to, to, to view it. Um, it doesn't take away the importance of our phenotypes for evaluation. 
Brilliant. Um, probably another question for, um, for Andrew Swan here, I think. But with the shift to 0.95 on the GRM, are the regression coefficients high or are there some traits back to 0.75? Uh, that's it's that was really specific to the facility change, really, Jake. Um, so for in the main evaluation, um, because we we're already doing um, single step, but just with a lower weighting, you're not going to see that sort of change. And in fact, the general result in um, in the main um, evaluation would be that for animals that are, are genotyped, but they don't have a trait recorded. So, you know, um, for hard to measure traits like feed intake and so on, you would generally see a little bit more spread, actually. That that would be the, the trend um, in the main analysis with, with these changes. The docility is just a little bit different because of, you know, we made the multiple changes, not just genomics, but the, the model. Brilliant. Um, and Christian, I'll, I'll just brief people on what they can expect to see from here, but just as a reminder um, to everyone on the webinar, when are we expecting to see these enhancements come out? When will people perhaps notice a change or um, see the enhancements um, come to fruition? Yeah, so essentially when we release our uh, December taste results, which essentially are scheduled to come out on the on the 27th of November or a day either side um, thereabouts, but before the end of the month, just, just put it that way. So these enhancements are going to be applied very soon. Um, coupled with that, um, other than this webinar, we are, you know, overcoming the next day or two, we're going to send out much more information too, Jake, to all members um, outlining these enhancements like we've talked about here, but just in a bit more detail. Um, so there'll be plenty of resources for people to refer to. Uh, but essentially, yeah, we'll see these see these enhancements, uh, you know, a bit in about a week's time. Brilliant. Thanks, Christian, and, um, and and thanks, Andrew, as well. Um, we'll see if there's any final questions at the end of this webinar, but we might um, just keep pushing on at this stage. Um, and the next um, uh, component that we would just like to give a brief overview of, just because we've got a captive audience today, is uh, some of the work that's been happening with the World Angus Evaluation, which is a, um, a, recent, um, uh, a recent project that has come to life and um, is now usable across um, well, across the world, but involving three main um, Angus populations, which of course is uh, Angus Australia, um, the American Angus Association, and also the Canadian Angus Association. Um, so I suppose what is the uh, uh, the World Angus Evaluation? It really is a globally focused genetic analysis of Angus cattle. Um, it's combining phenotypes, genotypes, and pedigree um, from those three associations that I mentioned. Um, and the results are delivered through uh, through AGI, Angus Genetics Incorporated, um, but they are delivered as expected progeny differences. So there are some differences there compared to what you would be used to seeing as um, as EBVs, um, as well as um, some of the units of measure, of course, different. Um, think about it, inches to centimetres um, and pounds, uh, pounds to kilos and things. So there is some things just to be um, aware of there. Why are we involved? Why, why was this on the um, uh, on the agenda or became a priority to to do? Um, we do firmly believe that um, you know the Angus community working together does benefit um, does benefit all of us, and it's really about providing opportunity to to benchmark animals across the you know somewhat of a global Angus database um, uh, about genetic merit and where those animals rank uh, amongst their peers, and particularly amongst cattle that are. Um, you know, in, in different countries and different production environments as well. Um, it also um, allows us a, 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 an additional tool for selection and genetic benchmarking as opposed to our TASE uh, EVVs. And we would stress that that is still um, the most relevant um, and, um, and most um, appropriate for a selection of cattle across Australia and New Zealand. But um, this does have now this additional tool where we can benchmark um, Australian size against uh, US size or Canadian size, for example. Um, and potentially, uh, it may invigorate some international trade of Angus genetics in terms of being able to showcase um, some of those Angus size that may particularly rank well um, against the, um, the global population. There are 13 EBD, uh, EPDs included. Um, I haven't listed them all here, but these are kind of the categories around calving ease, fertility, growth, some of those maternal uh, traits as well, and of course, carcass traits. Um, of which there are a couple of differences there, which um, I'd encourage you to go and go and look at and investigate further. 
How can you participate? Um, well, you may well already be participating and not know about it, um, but effectively, if you've um, collected and um, submitted information uh, for TACE, um, then it will automatically be included in this evaluation. That includes genotypes as well. Um, so effectively, if you've met the Angus um, criteria in terms of breed percentage, um, and particularly also if they're a, a sire with uh, progeny registered and they've been used recently in the last couple of years, um, then there's a good chance that they will actually have um, a reportable EPDs uh, within this benchmark. And so you don't actually have to do anything different to participate um, at all. One of the um, reasons that um, it is important to, to use this as a, um, uh, I suppose, as a point of uh, further information is that um, animals will likely rank differently to how they do on their EB, EBVs. And um, you can see here for this one example, which is um, just the, the weaning weight EPDs um, or that sort of 200 day weight, we would refer to it in the, uh, in the EBVs. Um, effectively, there is summary ranking, there's, there's good correlations, but um, there is summary ranking. And so we would encourage members, um, once you've familiarised yourself with how to find the, um, the search tool, which I'll show you in just a few moments and be able to bring up some reports just to um, perhaps see out of interest where some of the size you've been using or considering to use may rank um, amongst that population. Um, so how do you access the results? Um, there's an online um, uh, free and, and importantly, you don't have to register uh, for it. There's online um, uh, size benchmarking search, uh, which I'll show you the, the link to in just a few moments. Um, it allows you to search for particular animals' names. Um, it allows you to, to put in some EPD criteria um, and to refine your searches. And, and that, uh, that particular search report will will um, deliver up to 300 um, sires or, or less, depending on what your criteria are, and you'll be able to, to rank them in ascending or descending order. And um, like I say, quite a useful tool, um, very different to our um, Angus Tech. Um, so if you've got uh, any questions or anything like that, um, we should be able to point you in the right direction. We've got some resources developed, which I'll show you, um, which will be able to assist you um, with what you wanted to look at. So just a reminder, not all animals are uh, part of this evaluation. Um, well, they're not part of the reporting at this stage, I should add. Um, they do need to have a, a minimum weaning weight accuracy of 0.45, um, need to have at least five or more weaning weight progeny um, and two more, two or more calves in the last couple of years. So effectively current size that are having a few progeny uh, with performance um, added and, and, um, and registered within those associations. Just briefly, there are some um, some some great, um, I suppose, um, a ranking of, of Australian animals, and you can see that within those top 300, um, Australian animals do uh, make up a good number of those top 300. So the Australian cattle are um, certainly competing very well, and depending on what traits. Um, but if I was to call out something like um, uh, Clawset, uh, um, for instance, um, or potentially marbling, or or something like that, um, as a proportion. Um, given that we probably have um, less cattle overall that we're contributing, um, we do actually make up um, quite a few of the higher ranking animals within those um, those traits, but overall as well. So there's some really good news stories um, for individual animals, individual breeders, but for Australian Angus cattle um, generally. And um, these are one of the reasons we think that possibly um, it may invigorate or encourage some trade um, uh, across the big pond. And if we look at the percentiles, uh, which is maybe an indication of how the uh, Australian Angus population um, do sit, and there's some there's some adjustments uh, adjustments here. So just take note, but um, you can effectively see that um, for things again like marbling and um, for, uh, claw angle and and things like that, claw set, um, we do rank as a percentile um, quite high compared to the rest of the population. Um, there's of course some traits there where maybe there's some genetics also across the globe that um, may be useful within our production systems or within individual breeding programs as well. So um, again, just an additional uh, selection tool that we've uh, been able to make available through our uh, partnerships with, uh, with American Angus and Canadian Angus. So um, how you would find this search tool, and some of you may well have done this already, but um, from, from the Angus Australia website through that uh, burger menu, which is the three lines at the top left-hand corner, um, effectively, this box will pop out and you can see the World Angus Evaluations highlighted there and a single click uh, will then take you through to this, uh, this central page where there's additional information um, uh, and videos and, and links to further information. But of course, that red uh, button there, which is the search tool, um, will actually take you through to the search database, uh, which is here. And um, I'm not going to demonstrate that today. We do have a pretty comprehensive video that shows you how to use this search tool. but 
um, effectively it's um, it's a sorting mechanism um, either based on cyanine or EPD criteria or uh, accuracy and, and you can look across those um, those associations for registrations as well. If you would like more information um, on that World Angus evaluation, uh, please head to our education centre and um, we've got a module there that's um, got eight or nine different chapters which includes some um, videos and written content and would be a great place to to um, to go for further information. Um, which I suppose officially brings us to the end of today's um, today's webinar. But again, we do have time if there's any further questions, um, and um, we yeah we can answer those now. But uh, if not, um, happy with all that as well. Christian, do you want to add anything further or? Oh, just just following on for that World Angus evaluation. So so essentially, we've presented. Um, We've essentially presented two two different genetic evaluations, but I just want to make it clear for um, for local selection and selecting cattle within the Australian and New Zealand Angus population, we still encourage members to primarily focus on taste. Um, that's still the best evaluation. It's got more traits. It's calibrated, you know, variance components. Everything's developed for our production systems here. So that's going to give us our best best information for for, for regional selection. I guess you would say it. Um, but the the World Angus Evaluation gives us a really unique tool to understand where we sit within the global population. And obviously, with the uh, a lot of US genetics coming to Australia, might give us some um, some insights on um, you know how we can, can can hone in on on the right selections from America and also invigorate that trade to try and get some genetics going back the other way. Um, not my area of expertise, but I'd be surprised if if something uh, doesn't happen out of that. Um, brilliant. And um, look, just just in closing, um, we'd certainly like to thank everyone for participating today and for those of you that have asked, asked questions. Um, just a reminder where to from here. Um, so the taste analysis, um, including the enhancements, um, effectively is due next week, as you've heard from Christian around the 27th or maybe maybe a day later or whatever it might be. But that that's effectively the aim at this stage. Um, there will also be um, electronic um, media and EDM uh, released uh, shortly, which will include um, all of the videos that you've seen today um, as individual videos. Um, we will also um, have a, um, a recording of today's webinar, so you'll be able to pick up or re-listen to questions and answers. Um, and we also have a, um, a central web page um, we'll also provide the link to, which will include uh, in things like written content, and there's also a brochure um, that will be av available electronically. Uh, which will um, include all of today's information and a little bit more as well. So um, if you have any questions, um, um, please contact the Angus Australia office um, or um, us directly, that's fine. But um, effectively, um, we are here to assist. And um, yeah, we're very proud of the, the collaboration and the, um, the support that we've had um, to be able to do this from our members, but also from our external partners um, like AGBU and, and ABRI and, um, and UNE. So with that, um, thank you, Andrew Swan, for your time today. Um, obviously, the work over the last um, uh, 12 or 24 months or however long it's been for these enhancements, but thank you for making your time today. Um, uh, Malshani as well, thank you. One of the quieter achievers of, uh, of the business, but um, it's great to showcase some of the work that um, you've been working on. Um, and also, of course, Christian for... Um, uh, yeah, for being um, uh, such a great driver of a lot of these enhancements and we do appreciate your work and, and time today. So um, unless there's anything else, I'd um, yeah, just call the, call the webinar to, um, to a close. Um, um, yeah, so everyone's happy with that. That um, fantastic and enjoy the, enjoy the rest of your day and um, yeah, have a great Christmas if we don't talk to you.